You go. Everybody that's coming going to be, uh, what did I, huh? Better. Hold on, hold on. Now. Hey, everybody, we're going to get started in just a few moments. Um, uh, if we can, just cut the volume up a little bit so that the preacher's voice can be uh, carried throughout the building just a little bit. And uh, as we're getting everything set up and everything going, um, because it, it'll strain you when you're trying to do that. And then also, um, if we can, um, let me give a few directives. Um, if y'all see anything strange on Facebook, uh, like yesterday, there was somebody that asked about a cash app, and they said, cash app this, please do not respond to those uh, requests. Number one, a lot of them are dummy um, Trojans, where they get into your website, your Facebook page, and then they try to disrupt or distract or do some things, and if you uh, cash app them, and it's an unfamiliar cash app, they ca and Cash App doesn't have no um, consumer-friendly security fe features. So if you Cash App them and it's a Trojan, they can go into your bank account that's attached to your Cash App, and they'll Cash App out everything that you got in you, okay? So I just want to let everybody know, when you see something like that, no, and the media team, please erase that stuff uh, immediately because it's not, um, they're not asking uh, to be blessed or to be helped, they're asking to uh, to be to be robbers. Yeah, yeah. And Jesus told us to be wise, but harmless. And uh, Mom ain't raised no fool. And the church said, "Amen, amen." About how long do we have to start up, crank up? We're ready? What's that? We're ready. All right. All right. What, let, let me also ask this. Before we go live, I hope we're not live, but if we are, oh, well, we're just housekeeping. Um, can we separate the two streams so that people can access the lecture and then access the worship? Okay? Because it's kind of difficult to navigate through that and some stuff we want to get to um, real fast. And Dr. Davis is doing a fabulous, fine job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So y'all, before we uh, present our lecturer for this, the third and final night of our uh, institute and lecture series, let me say this, and I'm real sentimental right now, um, especially, and if you see me crying, it's because I'm gonna have to kiss my son and tell him uh, bye and send him off to the airport. Um, so y'all just y'all just bear with me if I get a little emotional because it's a lot of good things that's happening right now, all right? So let me share this with you. Um, I was sharing with Dr. Davis earlier today that um, a lot of what he's talked about has laid a great foundation for where St. Timothy is headed. From day one, y'all, our motto has been since October, no, yeah, October 23rd, October 23rd, our motto has been um, we want to glorify God and 
impact people. Real simple, real simple. If it doesn't glorify God, and if it doesn't make a positive impact on people, I don't think we need to do it. We need to just use what I would call, or use what we called in corporate America, the KISS method. No, not stupid. No, no, no. No, no. Let's keep it simple. You can still have one S and it still say KISS. Yeah. Okay. All right. Boy, this is week two you've done that to me. Boy, I'm telling you, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. No, 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 no. She said something else uh, in a Bible study, and I just cracked up. Whoa. All right. So, um, yeah, you, my breath's stinking right now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I didn't know. I want to be cautious of that. So um, what he's laid for us over the past couple of nights has been, it has spoke directly to where we're heading as a church. So a couple of things that he has said. Uh, number one is a um, uh, couple of things that he said was, uh, number one, um, get into the grace of God. Get into the grace. God has given us grace to do what we need to do. And he gave us a definition for grace. I'm not giving his lecture, but I'm just establishing something. Then he also said, make sure, one of the things that stuck out to me was, make sure that we uh, operate um, not like his daughter did, but after they finished putting the puzzle together, make sure that we make sure make sure that we are in the right place at the right time, right? Right? And then uh, there was a couple other things that he said, but I'm not going to steal his thunder um, because he is of age and can speak for himself. I was just establishing and saying that I believe that the foundation is being laid for us. So as we move forward as a church... These things are going to come up in our meetings, in our worship, also in our doing and being. We're going to bring these things back up because we didn't bring him all the way from Memphis, Tennessee, and ask him to stop being the president. Well, he hadn't stopped, but pause from being the president of one of our historic black colleges and universities. Pause from spending time with his lovely wife and children and grandkid. Spending, uh, pause from pastoring his amazing church where he grew the church from uh, 300 to over 2,000 now, I believe it is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, several years ago, uh, he was uh, the dean um, of Memphis Theological. And as dean, he grew our doctoral cohort from 15 students to 130. Wherever he goes, growth follows him. When we were running, and he was running as president, and I was his campaign manager, and I was trying to glean all I could, um, we started out with like 110 churches, 70, uh, one of them was active, and uh, and only uh, 45 of them wanted to participate. When he got in and he presented the plan, his vision for our state convention, we instantly started busting out the seams and we went from 110 active churches to, I can't remember, what was the number? 432 uh, churches in our state convention. I'm sharing these things because I believe a lot of time Greatness is in front of us, and we get too familiar with greatness that we don't celebrate, and we become crabs in the barrel. And what I never want to be guilty of is being a crab in the barrel and not celebrating those who have special, unique calls, gifting, and can do things exceedingly well. All I'm saying is, I'm grateful to have my friend, my brother, one of my best friends, Reverend Dr. Christopher Bernard Davis Sr. to be with us. Come on, let's celebrate him as he comes. Let's pray together. God, we love you, we bless you, we thank you for being an awesome and an amazing God. Be with us now, dear God, so that all that we say and do would bring glory and honor to your name. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. We 
normally don't pray, pray that fast, but he took some of my time. Listen, lift your Bible, lift your Bible, lift your Bibles. Let's say together what the Word of God says. Okay. I thought he was trying to attack me or something. All right. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I'm a believer, not a doubter. I'm a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better. After having heard the word of faith, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And just so you all will know, I'm sure you probably picked up on it last night. I normally take the first seven or eight minutes and say again what I said the night before. It is not because I have forgotten, but I am convinced that learning takes place through repetition. Amen? Again, as I mentioned to you on night number one, Romans chapter five, verses one and two, is sort of our foundational text you all for this teaching. And I'm going to tell you, the more I dig into this thing, I think the more awesome it becomes and the more the Holy Spirit reveals to us in terms of enabling us and empowering us, amen, to do those things that God requires of us. Amen? amen. Are you in Romans chapter 5? Yes. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Again, we are working through what we're calling greater grace, for greater works. And the emphasis, you all, has been on the grace to fulfill God's expectation. In other words, I believe that there is a measure of grace that you and I have to tap into in order to do all that it is God is calling us to do. Amen? Amen. We found out on night number one that grace is multifaceted. However, we also understand that grace is accessed by faith. And we found out that grace can be, you all, given in greater measure. Let me say that again. It is possible to tap into a greater measure of grace for a specific call and a specific purpose. Now, we know that all of us have learned in church that grace is the unmerited favor of God. But I need for you to understand it is so much more than that. It is more than just the unmerited face of favor. It is more than just the unmerited favor of God. Then, Davis, what is it? It is the power of God. It is the anointing of God. It is the ability of God on your life to function you all in life and in ministry at a level beyond your training and or education. To be able to function in such a way, not only does it blow other folks' mind, it blows your mind. Are, are you hearing me? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about tapping into in this measure of grace. Therefore, it's important for you, 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 and me to get a revelation on grace and understand that you access grace and you receive this grace by faith. That is the grace of God, the power of God, the anointing of God, the ability of God is something that God freely gives to you and I. God freely gives it to us, but we have to make the choice to tap into it. Somebody say tap into it. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4, we see that we are exhorted by the Apostle Paul to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. That is, God has saved us. God has called us. God has brought us into the kingdom. We have been brought into the family of God for his own purposes. Are you in Ephesians chapter 4? Somebody read verse number 1. You are worthy of the vocation wherein you have been called. So you and I, we've been summoned. We have been called into service of the Lord. Listen to me. If you are a believer, if you are a believer, notice, I didn't say if you were a preacher, if you were a deacon, if you were a trustee, no ma'am, no sir. If you are a believer, then you need to understand you have been called in service to the Lord. Are you hearing me? And what we have been trying to help you understand over the course of these last two nights is that when God calls you into a particular service, no matter where the assignment to serve is, God equips you to carry it out. Here it is. 
with excellence. Let me say it enough. Let me say it again. You have been called into service. And wherever God assigns you in the body of Christ, God expects you, God has equipped you to carry that assignment out with excellence. You don't do enough just to get by. You don't do enough just to be able to check off the box. But there is an expectation that you do it with excellence. Are you hearing me? Because the expectation is God expects you, God expects me to be productive wherever he places us. Are you still with me? Yes. Now, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Because Paul talks about, just be doing a quick review, Paul talks about you all, this, this special grace, this special calling that's on his life. And here's the thing, what God does in principle for one, God is obligated to do for another. Otherwise, God becomes guilty of being a respecter of person. Are you hearing me? Yes. Are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Yes. Read verse number 10. Mm -hmm. so notice Paul talks about you all this grace he, he, he describes it as a special endowment a special empowerment so that he would be able to carry out his task Paul says listen do not crown me Jesus Jr. and treat me like a superstar he says, don't, don't be fascinated by all the letters I wrote to the various churches and everything I was able to do in the name of ministry and all that good stuff. He said, it was not about me. He said, but God gave me grace. He gave me a special endowment to do what it is he was calling me to do. Now, the reason I want to point that out is because I need for you to understand that not all ministry assignments are the same. Did you know what I just said? Not all ministry assignments are the same. But God gives you sufficient grace to carry out what it is he has called you to do. And when you begin to operate in a place in space where God has not called you simply because you thought it was a good idea or you thought you might get more recognition in that space, the only thing you're going to do is hinder the work of the church and ultimately embarrass yourself. Did you hear what I said? Because there is something to be said about operating in the places and the spaces where God has gifted you and graced you to operate. Come on, nod your head. Now, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because I need for you to understand, your level of faith is going to determine, you all, the magnitude and the effectiveness of your ministry task and your assignment. So whether you're a nursery, nursery worker or you're the lead singer in the mass choir, how you use your faith will determine how productive you're going to be in your area of ministry. Are you in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Somebody read verse number 10. wait a minute. Let me tell you what that means. That means just because I've been given grace, that means I don't get to sit down and say, let grace do what it's going to do. Absolutely not. I have to put forth some effort. That's what Paul is saying. Paul says, watch this now, don't miss this. Paul said, he gave the grace, but I did the work. And that's what we have to understand. God gives the grace, but we have to do the work. Since I know you work, I'm not sure about your neighbor. Point to your neighbor and tell them, you got to do the work. You got to do the work. Listen to me, you all. Hear what I'm about to tell you. God, somebody say God. God is raising up leaders in the body of Christ. God is raising up leaders in the local church. And what I have come all the way from Memphis to Cleveland to do is light a fire under some of you all. Are you hearing me? Because God is already talking to you about getting involved at St. Timothy at a greater level. So all I've come to do is to confirm what God has already spoken to you. And my job is to motivate you 
to be faithful to what you know God is already calling you to do. And watch this. I'm about to deliver about 13 of y'all. And you cannot be intimidated by what other folks are already doing. See, many of us don't actively engage because we're intimidated by what other folks are already doing. Because while there may be other people that are already operating in a spirit of excellence, if they were able to do all of the work, then the Lord wouldn't have called you. The reason the Lord is messing with you is because there is more work to be done. Are you hearing me? That's why I call this greater grace for greater works. There is still some more to be done. Listen to me, you all. Ministry, churches are the sum total of all of its parts. So every part has to work in order for greater works to be done. And if you're intimidated, if you're not in your assigned place, if you're not doing your part, then what you're really doing, you're not helping the ministry, you're hindering the ministry. Did you hear what I just said? If you are not in your assigned place and you are not doing your part because you're intimidated by what somebody else is already doing, you're not helping the ministry, you are hindering the ministry. Come on, nod your head. Mm. Let me ask you a question. How many of y'all believe the Bible? Y'all believe the Bible? Okay, watch this. The Bible says that God gives pastors after his own heart. Y'all believe that? Okay. Well, if God gives pastors after his own heart, then that presupposes that God also gives the assignment. Can we agree with that? Well, now watch this. If God gives pastors after his own heart, and then God also gives the assignment, when God gives the assignment, then God obligates himself to send people to help fulfill the assignment. Hello, somebody. So watch what, let me tell you what that means now. Don't you miss this? That means God is obligated to stir your heart, to quicken your spirit. But remember I told you on night one, your will is still the most dominant factor in the earth governing your choices. So watch this. God has done his part. He's given the assignment. Holy Spirit has done his heart part. He has messed with your heart. But now you got to do your part and say, yes, Lord, I'm willing. Once you say, yes, Lord, I'm willing, the work is not over. Now you've got to tap into the grace in order to get what you need uh, to get the work done. Come on, now, your head right there. Let me tell you something. How many of you all believe that it's God's plan to grow St. Timothy? You believe that? What if I told you God already gave me the plan for how he's going to grow St. Timothy and told me today while I was studying that it was all right with him for me to share the plan with you? Because God says you cannot be held responsible for what you don't know. So now, Torbert can't stand up and say, the Lord won't send Timothy to grow. Davis can't stand up and say, the Lord won't send Timothy to grow. And nobody ever bothers to tell you what the plan is for St. Timothy to grow. So the Lord told me I had his permission. I didn't even ask Torbert. If the Lord said it was okay, then I know it was okay. The Lord told me it was okay to share with you all his plan to grow St. Timothy. Here it is. Are you ready for it? The plan is to release the pew. Now tell the person next to you, say neighbor. The plan is to release the pew and the pew be you. The plan now is to release the pew and the pew be you. Now, you got to get this now. 
God's plan for us to raise up others who believe in the vision, who are committed to greater works, and then send them forth to touch and inspire others. Okay, you didn't like that. But in order to do that, you got to be willing to say, okay, God, this is the calling. Don't miss this. That's on my church. This is the calling that's on my pastor. And if this is the call that's on my church, and this is the call that's on my pastor, then it stands to reason that this is the call that's on me. Ah. Okay, let me show you something. Did I tell you to go to Ephesians chapter 3? Look at verse 7. Because I can tell by 18 of y'all think I'm making it up. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 7. Somebody read it for me. So wait a minute. Is that what y'all Bible said? So I made a minister by grace. Not by a vote. Not by an ordination council. Not by a frame certificate on the wall. I am made a minister by grace. Which says only God can make a minister. Because what makes a minister effective is not his or her head knowledge. But what makes him or her effective is the calling. It's the anointing of God. It is the grace of God on their lives. So if nobody ever calls you Reverend Dr. Elder Bishop, Are you hearing me? If they never sit you in the back room and ask you questions that you've already supposed to memorize the answer to, then bring you out before the church, lay a Bible on top of your head and pray for you. Let everybody that prays sign your certificate frame and then stick it on the wall. If you never go through that experience, if you've got the grace of God, the anointing of God, the call of God, then you are a minister of God. Are you hearing me? Now, here is the thing. So if God calls us to be ministers, then in order to be fair to us, God has to make his expectations known to us. Otherwise, God can't hold you accountable. You can't be held accountable for what you're supposed to do if you don't know you're supposed to do it. You got to get that now. So what God expects of us has to be made known to us. Otherwise, he cannot hold us accountable for what it is he has called us to do. So, he's got to make it known to us. Davis, how does he do it? I'm glad you asked me. By the witness of his word, by the witness of ordained men and women of God, and by the witness of the Holy Spirit. By the witness of his word, by the witness of ordained men and women of God, and by the witness of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? And I believe the reason God does that is twofold. Number one, the Bible says every word will be, you know what I'm saying, every word will be established by two or three witnesses. Are you with me? And so I believe the reason he gives us two or three options in order for us to know is that therefore when we stand before him, you can't lie and say you didn't know. Because see, some of us will say, well, Lord, you know I couldn't read. But then the Lord said, could you hear? Amen. Right. Hello? Did, you know, so you, so you, you didn't read it, but did you hear it right. when the man and woman of God spoke it? Right. You know, so did you feel something right. when they uttered it as a means of confirming it? Right. And then you have to say, yeah, Lord, I do. So you didn't do not because you didn't know to do. You didn't do because you didn't want to do. Amen. Come on, nod your head. Are you go to go to Acts chapter 16? Go to Acts chapter 16, verses 9 and 10. Acts chapter 16. Now let me say this. Now let me say this. Now real thought. All foolishness aside. Before we get to Acts 16, 9 and 10, if your heart ain't right, if you really, if you really are not ready to receive instruction. 
if you really don't believe the Bible, this is as good a time as any to put your finger up and leave. At this point, I'm as serious as two heart attacks, and it only take one to kill you. Because, see, what we're getting ready to get into now, this is beyond what you think, what you heard, what your mom and them said. This comes directly from the book. So, nobody walked out. All right, let's do it. Acts chapter 16, are you there? Read verse 9 and 10. I'm about to see what your memory's made of now, Toby. Acts 16. Uh-huh. 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 Now the question is, how did they receive the calling? The Bible says they received their calling by way of the vision that the man of God had. So God never talked to them individually. God talked to the man of God whose vision they set under. And their, watch this now, and their calling was based on the instructions they received from the man of God concerning the vision that God had given him. Are you hearing me? Paul got a vision of a man saying, come over here and help us. Paul told them what God told him, and they messed around and said, and we endeavored to go, for we knew God had called us. Now, God talked to him. He talked to them, and they said, it's a we thing, let's go. Hello? Now I'm trying to deliver about 17 of y'all. You are absolutely right. You put your pants on one leg at a time, just like your pastor, but you're not like your pastor. Are you hearing me? And the reason God does not talk to him, you, 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 and you, is because the Lord says, that is not the way I've designed this thing. He says, I'm going to talk to him then you got to decide whether or not you trust him. Because if you don't trust him, you won't follow him. Are you hearing me? So it's never, it's never a matter of whether or not you understand. You understand plenty. You don't have a comprehension issue. You have a trust issue. Because let me tell you something. You can sit at the table of a James Beard award-winning master chef and starve to death if you don't trust the cook. Because it doesn't make a difference how talented the cook is. If you don't trust him, you won't eat. Come on, nod your head right there. And the reason I'm pointing this out, you all, is because, look, I've been black and Baptist my whole life. And one of the things that I understand that we struggle with in black Baptist churches is that all of a sudden, we have made contemporary church practices more important than what the Bible says. What do you mean Davis? Because contemporary church operations feel like the majority has to go along with it in order for it to be from God. If the majority doesn't agree, then it can't be from God. That may be the way you operate but that's not Bible. That's not Bible. Okay, you're looking at me funny. I like the way you read. Go to number 13. Go to number 13. I'm going to do my best. Number 13. Read one through three. Where you at, Doc? 
we in number 13. I hear the act, okay, yeah. Look, other, there are other numbers. The other one. The one that started with N. Yeah, that one, that one. That's why I got to turn to myself. I said, wait a minute. Number 13. One through three. There it is. Twenty-five through and 31. right there. Did y'all track, did y'all follow all of that? Right. Then let me tell you what you just discovered. What you just discovered is the majority missed it. Right. For those of us who feel like in order for it to be God, the majority has to always go along with it. You just saw in your Bible, if you didn't tear it out, that the majority missed it. Right. And do you know why that story is in scripture? to help black Baptist folk understand that God is not a democracy. He is not. God is not a democracy. God is a theocracy. This is not about pulpit versus pew. This is not about pastor versus people. This is to remind us that God runs it all. God runs it all. Are you hearing me? And he runs it through the person that he set in place. Now, tell the person sitting next to you, especially if they ain't smiling, look at him and tell them, say, neighbor, don't get caught up in the flesh and miss the revelation. Don't get caught up in the flesh and miss the revelation. You say it. You quote. Let all things be done how? Decently and in order. And this is God's order. He gives the vision to his set person, and he intends for those around him or her to commit to the vision. Now, this does not mean that God is not going to use you because you're in your set place. Let me tell you what God's going to do. Let me tell you what God's going to do. Because I know you want to be involved. You want to participate. But listen, I'm going to show you how to participate in ways that are much more meaningful than a vote. This is the way the thing works. God is going to give the set man the vision. He's going to then articulate the vision to the people. And when you open up your heart and receive the vision, all of a sudden God is going to begin to flood your mind with ideas of how to bring the vision to pass. Because now watch this now. Now, this is not about checking your neighbor. This is about checking yourself. Because see, we like to tell ourselves that we're supportive, 
that we're in agreement, but let me tell you how you can determine whether or not you're really in agreement and whether or not you're really supported. Not based on what's coming out your mouth, because my big mama told me you can make a mouth say anything. Are you hearing me? This is how you determine whether or not you're really on board. When the vision is articulated, when your heart really is in it, all of a sudden, God begins to give you thoughts and ideas and plans and strategies for how we can get this thing done. Amen. Are you hearing me? Yes. Pastor said we're going to do this. And all of a sudden, Lord, bring your mind. Have you all ever thought about contacting this person? Have they ever looked at this? Right. Have they given thought to this? Right. All of a sudden, you begin to get thoughts and ideas about how you can help, yes. not how you can hinder. Come on, nod your head. Yes. Come on, nod your head. Again, there's a grace on your life that you've got to tap into because God will give me a part, but he will also give you a part. Are you hearing me? And hear me, without your part, it will not work as a whole. Hmm. Go to Acts chapter 8. Go to Acts chapter 8. I told you, God makes the assignment known through the witness of his word, the witness of ordained men and women, and through the witness of the Holy Spirit. And I asked him all the time, I said, tell me something. I said, as intelligent as all three parts of the Godhead is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, why would the Holy Spirit tell you something contrary to what he already told me? Why would he give me instruction and then give you a different set of instruction which would make both of us the head and anything with two heads is a freak of nature? I'm just asking a question now, y'all. Listen, I had a preacher call me one time. Doc, man, look at here. I got a message for your people. Lord told me to call you and tell you, David. He gave me a word for your folk. I said, what? He said, I'm telling you now. The Lord gave me a word for your folk and called me, told me to call you and tell you. I said, I said, I'm hurt. He said, what? I said, I'm hurt. I said, I don't even remember the last time. I said, I felt this kind of hurt. He said, what you mean? I said, I just talked to the Lord this morning. And he didn't say a word to me about you. And I thought me and the Lord was better than that. You mean to tell me that the Lord would give somebody a word to preach at the church that he has made me steward over and not tell me a thing about it? Listen, I'm hurt. And so I'm going to tell you what, until me and God can work this thing out, I'm going to have to put you on hold. I said, because I can't have out with God because I won't receive what you're saying. So you hold on to your message until me and God work this thing out. Hello? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Go to, go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Now you remember on last night, we talked about, you know, being sanctified, living a set-apart life. Y'all remember that? And when you have been called by God to do this work, you all, that means when you're saved, that means your life has been set apart for God's service. But here's the problem. Most of us, the reason the church can't get to where God wants it to be is because most of us, and notice I'm including me too, because there have been times in my life when I was guilty. Let me tell you what we've done. We pinch off a part of our life for God. Mm. God, you can have Sunday. Not the whole day, though. I'm going to give you three hours. Now, now, Lord, there's travel time, Sunday school time, service time. And back home time. Hello? We 
we pinch off part. Are you with me? Are you in John chapter 2? I said 2 Timothy chapter 2, didn't it? I, okay, I'm going to go there too, but I want to get this right now. Let me take, make a quick little detour. Go to John chapter 2. I'm going to come back there. I'm going to make a quick little detour. Make, make a detour. John 2. I need to make this detour. And let me tell you why I want to make this detour. Because I recognize for a whole lot of y'all, everything I'm saying putting some real pressure on you. And when you got that kind of pressure on you, I need to encourage you. And here's the encouragement, y'all. If you do what God says, he'll give you what you want. If you do what God says, he'll give you what you want. Are you in John chapter 2? Somebody read verse 2. Is chapter 2 verse 2? I might be look. I might be remembering it wrong. Y'all might be right. Well, let's see. Let's see. No, 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 no. That's right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely right. I should have said two and three a. Read two and then read the a part of verse three. John chapter 2, verse 2, and the first sentence of verse 3. That's right. That's all I want. Read verse 2 and read that little part. Read verse 2 again. Yes. Read the, ver read the next one. You can stop right there. They want it. This, I want you to get this now. This has nothing to do with salvation. This has nothing to do with anything spiritual. Are you with me? Has nothing to do with salvation. Has nothing to do with anything spiritual. Are you with me? They just wanted it. Are you still in verse number two? Read three, four, and five. person sitting next to you, say neighbor, neighbor. Whatever, he says, whatever he says, do it, do it. and you get, what you, want. Right. you get what you want. Verse 3 says, they want it, why? Right. Listen, ain't said nothing about no communion either. Right. Right. This ain't nothing spiritual, right. ain't got nothing to do with salvation, right. this ain't got nothing to do with heaven, I wish I had somebody, right. they just wanted it. Right. Hello somebody. But wife give, are you still in John chapter 2? Yes. Somebody read 6 through 10. Because I don't want you to think I'm making it up. Mm -hmm. If you do what he 
he will give you what you what you just said is going to be better than what you if you do what he said are, are you hearing me you all hear me when I tell you this oftentimes we struggle to submit ourselves to leadership and authority because we think it's all about them even if we believe what they're saying comes directly from the Lord we will still buck against the prick because we think somehow it just benefits them but I just showed you in your Bible it's, it didn't say they needed wine they wanted wine and the reason I want to point that out is because so often we think when we're in relationship with the Lord, the only thing you can get is what you need. The devil is a lie. Right, right. I'm telling you that when you serve God, not only can you get what you need, you can also get some of what you If you do what he says, you want Timothy to grow, do what he says. You want Timothy to be blessed, do what he says. You want to experience increase? Do what he says. If you do what he says, he'll give you what you want. Let me hustle, let me hustle, because your pastor cut into my time, but I got to give you this part right here. See, is Bill here yet? Oh, no, I'm going to take some of his time. Watch this. <laughs> take some of his time. <laughs> Watch this here. And in, um, in Luke chapter 14, and I got my eyes on the clock, y'all. In Luke chapter 14, we find the parable of the great feast. He's invited everyone. And when the meal is ready and he sends for them, they all begin to make excuses. Now, the Spirit of God helped me to understand that not only was the guy offended by them not coming, but they dishonored him. I'm going somewhere with this. If you ever paid any attention to a wedding invitation, it says... Honor us with your presence. Mm. You see, when I'm where I'm supposed to be, it's respectful and it's honorable to the person that invited me. We as believers, as members of St. Timothy, must understand that we honor God just by being where he wants us to be. Now, I need you to get this. Our place is is important. Tell the person next to you, say, your place is important. Watch this now. And when you're not in your place, this might be the best thing I said all week. Hear me, St. Timothy, and I need for you to get this because I need for you to communicate this in a loving way to the members of St. Timothy who were not here tonight, who were here for Easter, but not here tonight. I need you to communicate this in a loving way. Are you hearing me? When you're not in your place, it sends a message. Empty pews send a message. When a pew is empty, it talks. Tell your neighbor, say, empty pews talk. Hmm. If you go to 1 Samuel chapter 20, go to 1 Samuel chapter 20, because in 1 Samuel chapter 20, this talks about everybody was in their place, but David's seat was empty, and empty seats sent a message. Say it again, say empty pews talk. Are you in 1 Samuel chapter 20? Read verse 25. them again say empty chairs talk chairs are empty in churches for any number of reasons I'm going to give you this and I'm going to get out your way number one sometimes pews are empty because of relationships that were rejected mm. sometimes pews are empty because of relationships that were rejected. What do you mean, Chris Davis? God spoke to somebody 
to fill that seat and they refused mm. I'm tired it raining it cold I don't feel like it I watch it on the stream I'm just telling you about the conversation of empty pew. See, you think an empty pew is just an empty pew, but an empty pew is a talking pew. And I need for you to understand that. So sometimes it's empty because of relationships that were rejected. The Lord invited them to come, and they rejected the relationship. Mm. Sometimes pews are empty because of what I like to call retarded righteousness. Mm. What is retarded righteousness, Davis? The retarded righteous are those who've just not grown up enough to understand that they're supposed to come to church all the time, not just when they ain't got nothing else to do. They just slow. Hello? That, that, that's what retarded means, slow. They've not figured out that when the Bible says, assemble yourselves together, that's what the Bible means. So sometimes the pews are empty because the retarded righteous are not in their place. Tell the person sitting next to you, don't be slow. Sometimes the pews are empty because of relationships that were rejected, retarded righteousness. Sometimes they're empty because of what I like to call the resentful rebuke. Mm. these are they that left because they could not take correction not everybody not everybody in the body can take correction I don't know who told me think he is I ain't got to stay here I can stay at home I ain't got to be here. If God sets you here, yes, you do. Hello, somebody. And I told you last night, you can get mad and run down the street with Reverend Pharaoh at Egypt Baptist Church. But when you get to heaven, if you make it to heaven, he ain't going to ask you nothing about what you did in Egypt. He want to know what did you do at Timothy. What did you do where I set you? Why are the pews empty? Relationships that were rejected. Retarded righteousness. Resentful rebuke. Sometimes they empty because of rebellious renegades. Tell somebody, ooh, I'm so glad I'm in the pew. Rebellious renegades. These are they who have hidden agendas, but they got exposed before they could do some damage. And exposure caused them to be shamed. And rather than repenting, they chose to run. Hello, somebody. Why are the pews empty? Relationships that were rejected, retarded righteous, resentful rebuked, rebellious renegades, and the reluctant redeemed. Mm. Tell your neighbor, he was talking about them. Now he's talking about us. Mm -hmm. that was a, he was talking about them. See, he done gone from teaching to meddling. Now he's talking about us. Do you know whose job it is to grow the body? The sheep. It's the sheep's job to grow the body. This see right here. Somebody you were supposed to talk to. Somebody you were supposed to bring somebody you were supposed to call somebody you were supposed to reach out to somebody you were supposed to pray for 
somebody you were supposed to encourage somebody you were supposed to be a neighbor to somebody you were supposed to be a brother or a sister to mm. but you're reluctant in your responsibility because in your mind you think all you need to do is come to church but that's not what Jesus said he said go into the highways and the byways and compare them to come. If the pews are to be filled with folks that you minister to, so if you ain't done no praying, you ain't done no sharing, you ain't done no talking, then how dare you walk in here on Sunday and see the pews and say, where the folk at? Did you reach out to them? Did you call them? Did you say, we miss you? Did you say, do you need a ride? You talk about everything else. You mean to tell me you can call somebody and say, child, you know I've been working, so I ain't been able to keep up. Who Victor Numa fooling with that? You break your neck to call your best friend and tell them, you better get by the store. They got 27 cans of cream style corn on sale for a dollar. <laughs> Listen, we talk about everything else. Everything else. So when you see the pews empty, St. Timothy, that says to me, you like to talk about growth but you don't want to be about growth. Because every time you walk in and see an empty pew, you ought to feel indicted. It ain't about what, who your neighbor didn't call or what they didn't do. But that whole service, you ought to feel bad. Because you ought to be saying to yourself, if I had called somebody, if I had stopped by and picked up somebody, if I had reached out to somebody, somebody, would have been sitting in that pew. Now watch this. I'm about to quit right here. But this is the litmus test right here. There are more field seats than there are empty seats. And if everybody here tonight takes it upon your seat, yourself to fill one seat, then come Sunday, the pastor ought to have to say, can y'all scoot in and make some room for the folk that are trying to get here. Easter doesn't have to be the only Sunday that we can feel the Lord's house. Are you hearing me? I got some more to say, but I ain't got no more time. So I'm going to just quit right there and thank you for your patience. Come on, we can do better than that. Can we thank God for Reverend Dr. Christopher Bernard Davis? Come on, we can do better than that. Come on. Hallelujah. My God, my God today. He has laid a solid foundation and has encouraged us as we will be walking into this new frontier as pastor and people doing what God has said. Come on, let's bless God one more time. Awesome. As we are uh, preparing to transition, let me just share just one announcement, and then we're going to transition really fast. Um, two of our members passed. Um, our, our beloved sister, Tina Walden, she transitioned. Her services will be a memorial service um, on April 13th at 11 a.m. Um, so for the first 10 minutes, um, we will share um, in a service um, 
that is germane to our church. And then after that, we will begin the memorial service and we will uh, celebrate Tina's life. Amen. It's just some people that just strike you and hit you well and you just love on them upon meeting them. And this and T Sister Tina was one of them for me. So I am totally in shock um, by this. Um, but I'm grateful and glad God gave her to me for just six months. So grateful, so grateful. Um, and then our dear uh, sister Georgia McLean, the second member I met here at the church, amen, while we were doing Bible study after the tornado. Um, her memorial service will be here at the church April 20th, and it starts at 11 a.m., same time, all right? So we are going to celebrate her life as well, and we are going to celebrate as a church. Um, as we prepare to transition, I'm going to ask Temple's Choir, if you don't mind, you could take the choir stand once we dismiss. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Minister Michael Haygood, if you don't mind, just lead us in 